Good afternoon and welcome to the Kaspersky webinar talking about cyber security for small and medium sized businesses. My name is Andrew Lintel, I am the Director for Corporate Sales here at Kaspersky Lab in the UK and today I am joined by an esteemed panel of experts who are going to debate cyber issues and threats facing the small to medium sized business market. I'm it gives me great pleasure, really, to introduce uh, some of these experts to you right now. As an introduction, we have, uh, to my right, Steve Fornell, who is the Professor for Information System Security with Plymouth University. Then we have uh, David M., who is a Senior Security Researcher at Kaspersky Lab. To my left, Andrew Rose, who is the Principal Analyst for Forrester Research. And last but not least, Peter Beardmore, who is the Director for Products and Services again at Kaspersky Lab. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you for joining me. Um, I guess let's just start, really, lots to talk about. It's a, quite a wide subject, this one, so I'll try and uh, keep it uh, reasonably focused, if I can. Really, let's start by framing the conversation. Um, the ongoing economic challenges that are facing businesses of all sizes at the moment are throwing up some pretty unique challenges for everybody, but also, I'd say, opportunities involving new working practices, technologies, uh, routes to market. So there's a, a, a myriad of options available for particularly the SMBs, but really not that many chances to get the right answer. So if we were to look at all of these options and understand how much more efficient and flexible they have to be in their working practices and some of the choices they have to make, really, let's look at the new security threat. What is the security threat landscape for SMBs today? David, can I start with you? Sure. Well, let me start from my perspective by just painting a picture of what the malware landscape looks like. What sort of malicious code are we seeing? For about 10 years now, we've faced cybercrime, malicious code for profit. Um, and in general, that has been uh, attacks which are random, speculative in nature, not targeted at you or me or any individual out there. We just happen to be unfortunate enough to get infected and for our data then to become a target. But actually over the last two years, uh, roughly speaking, we have seen an increase in what we would call targeted attacks. This is where the cyber criminals know exactly which target they want to go for. They gather their intelligence, they frame their code, and they're going after specific data, specific information, or indeed they want to disrupt that business. So that in broad terms is the threat landscape that we're facing right now. Right, and are, are SMBs not immune to this particular type of style of threat? No, they're not. I, I think everybody from individual people working at home to people working on the road to small businesses, large enterprises, there is no organization that is immune. And actually, hardly a week goes by when we don't see headlines in the computer press about targeted attacks. And it can be very, very large organizations, or it can actually be very, very small organizations too. Nobody is immune. Nobody gets overlooked by the cyber criminals if there's a potential to make money. I see. I understand. So what will we say? that the, Are there any differences, really, between... The, the type and style of a threat that, that an enterprise would face versus an SMB? I, I, I don't think it's the type of threat so much as it is the different challenges that each of those face by virtue of the size, how perhaps dispersed they are in terms of different offices. So it's not so much the threat as actually the infrastructure that they're trying to defend. It's the infrastructure and the resource. Mm. There's obviously a, a market scale in resource that a large organization has. When I worked in the legal sector, we had only the top tier of, of firms actually had a specialist security manager. And we took, a, a, took it upon ourselves to make sure that we shared that information with the smaller firms who just had an IT guy trying to cover both bases, to try and uh, distill that information down to them so they could get value from the, the, I, the uh, fact that we had time to think about this and the, the ability to spend time looking into these things. Uh, small firms just don't have that. That IT guys are pulled in several different directions at once and they have a real problem keeping up with that. So who, who might actually be targeting the SMBs? Who are behind these attacks? Well, I think one of the problems we face in this day and age is actually we live in uh, what is a small world. I mean, we're all on the end of a, of a wire, or not, it could be wireless, which connects us to anybody else anywhere in the world. Now, you know, obviously we're all limited by geography, by legal jurisdiction. 
but sadly cyber criminals aren't, which means that a cyber criminal in Brazil or Australia or Canada can quite easily launch an attack on somebody here in the UK. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking here about what some call a dark market, which is made up of individuals who sell their code, or it could be groups of people who are managing botnets, compromised machines, networks of compromised machines, people who are, um, you know, laundering money from one geography to another. It, it really is as differentiated as the legitimate market for which it's really the flip side. All right, understood. So, if we were to look at through the, through the lens of SMB, what are the particular uh, issues they face when it comes to securing their activities and operations? I think that, you know, a couple of issues uh, trailing on the, the, the conversation that, uh, that David was talking about. A lot of times SMBs, quite frankly, don't know, you know, mm -hmm. to your point, from an awareness standpoint, about targeted threats and the nature of what's actually going on there. And, you know, it's a two-year-old phenomenon, but it's already, you know, kind of finding its way to the back page of the newspaper. And the one, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the events that are happening are usually that are rising to the top in terms of the press and news coverage are the really big ones, right? The RSA, the Lockheed Martin type uh, uh, type of events. But you know, the reality is, and our, our research suggests that uh, the SMBs are a, are an equal target. And and oftentimes SMBs believe, you know, well, what do I have to offer? What do I have to share? You know, and I'm just another you know small business out there, and I'm going to fly below the radar and be somewhat obscure. And that that unfortunately is is not the situation. Um, in terms of what they really have to face, though, in their day to day life, is uh, uh, just a, a continuing uh, or a, a constantly increasing magnitude of things that they need to see and control and protect, mm -hmm. uh, and that's you know largely endpoints. And you know, a few years ago, it was just a PC or a laptop, uh, but that's obviously expanding rapidly to include tablets and, and mobile devices, uh, multiple platforms. Uh, in many cases, not owned or controlled by the by the business itself. So the the complexities uh, are are increasing. Uh, really, you know, astronomically, and <laughs> the resources are not. You know, to your point Absolutely. earlier, mm -hmm. the resources are finite. It's two or three guys in a lot of cases, if that. In some cases, the resources are contracting, uh, and uh, and it's an awful lot more to deal with. Do Absolutely. do more with less. Oh, absolutely. And I think the priority is another key issue. You look at the board members. The CEO in small organizations is probably a lot more aligned with the business, really focused on what needs to be done to get profit coming in. And they might face a very stark choice between paying the staff or buying a new technology device to protect security. You always know what's going to come first. So it's very difficult to get security up the priority list and actually fight for that investment to start to buy solutions and put things in place. There's been a lot of recent headlines um, uh, to drive some of that awareness up, I would say, onto mm -hmm. the broadsheet newspapers of the MD on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. um, terms such as cyber espionage, cyber warfare, mm -hmm. hacktivism, things like that. So what does that actually mean for an SMB, though? You know, does that really help them get that kind of message I across? Think, I think it does. We've done some research recently in Forrester, and we've found that actually the amount of awareness at board level of cybersecurity has never been higher. So 77%, I believe it is, of CEOs are aware of cybersecurity and what it means. Right. So it, it probably still sounds like a low figure, but actually it's much better than it's ever been before. So people who want to talk about security with the board, which is where they should be talking about it, mm -hmm. this is the now, you know, now is the time to speak about it. Yes. There's so many examples out there now of uh, LinkedIn, of Last FM. there's so many examples. Um, now is the time to start that conversation. And they're increasingly aware that it's not just the risk to their intellectual property or to their own bank accounts, but it's also the risk to their customers and to their partners. And, you know, obviously that's been highlighted as we've tracked and done the forensics on a number of these high-profile cases over time that, you know, we're not just targeting the target, we're targeting the target's friends and family uh, to, to get to the target. And having that awareness raised at board levels essential but of course it still goes back to the point that Andrew mentioned previously about the level of capacity resource and skills to actually deal with the problem now that it's been recognized so there needs to be that awareness of what the technology that's in place actually demands in terms of protection and the ability to do something about it. I think too because that changes over time Steve I think it's important that any organization recognizes that there's a moving target mm. here, mm. and actually security becomes a process. You, you, it's, not, it's like painting the garden shed. You do it, you do it as well as you can, but you know you're going to have to do it again next year because it's not a once 
solves all mm. type of scenario. And there's a, an amazing number of technologies succeeding one another, flying at people. Some, you know, they've got control over, some they have less control over, but they still have to face it. So security really, it's important that people realise it's a process. And it's that appreciation of the breadth as well, so knowing that it's not just one particular type of thing that's always hitting the, the top marks in the survey, the thing that people are experiencing or types of protection that people have. It's, it's knowing, okay, you're moving into new technologies, you're moving into new services, mm. the protection methods need to change with it, and the thing that you were, to a degree, able to rely on as covering most of your bases, now is leaving you still exposed. Yes, yeah, so I guess if we were to also look at the, the choices, the adoption of these new technologies mm. and, and new platforms as well. So, uh, for example, the, one of the board, members of the board after Christmas comes in, he presents the, uh, everyone his nice new shiny tablet, mm -hmm. and at that point, of course, then wishes to use that as long as he prefers to use it, much more of a, a nicer look and feel for whatever reason. That does represent a significant amount of challenge, I would have said, to particularly an SMB mm -hmm. who have got only a finite amount of resources. Absolutely. How does that sort of decision impact the rest of the business? It needs to be communicated to the highest level about the potential impact of this, this new technology. We've all heard the story of you know, the CEO or the board member who took the stats on his iPad, left it on the train, phoned up IT and said, can you wipe it for me remotely? So, we can't do that on an iPad. We don't have that technology yet. There's perhaps an assumption at that business level that there's more capacity than there is. IT needs to be communicating the fact that these new uh, devices are great and they great, give great abilities, but they come with consequences. And those consequences must be discussed, must be highlighted. And then you start to talk about risk appetite. Perhaps your firm's happy just to go ahead with no extra software on there, no extra controls. But that's a discussion, that's a business decision that needs to be made, not something that IT should be making separately. I think it's one of the more interesting kind of decision points for many businesses because it's, uh, for the first time probably in a long time, been driven from the top down, even in the smallest of businesses. So uh, this is an interesting point. Bring your own device. Should SMBs embrace it? Well, I think to a degree they'll find themselves doing so regardless because in whatever form, there will be certain elements of their data that find themselves onto personally owned devices, the consumer grade things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the example of the CEO coming in with the new device is a, is a sort of a top level example of it, but there's going to be many other people who've also got the, the new smartphone, the new tablet for Christmas or whatever as well. And there will be that temptation, that drive for them to end up using it as a, a work device in some shape or form, even if it's only down to storing work-related contact information on there, it's still something that could, in the wrong hands, be exposing the company. It could, but so many other risks like that out there already. That's why security is so difficult and such a challenge. You just consider Dropbox. And Dropbox is very easy to put on your desktop. I'm sure lots of people have it already. And all of a sudden, it's siphoning all the work information and placing it in the cloud and on other people's PCs. We're not even talking about bring your own device, and all of a sudden, all the data's gone straight away. So there's so many different aspects that you know, IT guys need to look at and consider, and that's what makes it a real challenge. It puts them in a very difficult position because you know, you've just given a couple of examples of things that the IT department constantly now has to you know, increase their scope and, and, and cover an awful lot more ground. But they're also being put in the situation where uh, it is incumbent upon them to communicate and to educate those you know, at superior levels who, quite frankly, may view them as just an internal service provider uh, whose job it is is to you know, make sure that the uh, uh, that the that the ones and zeros are coming at a fast rate, but you know the reality is is that the, in in most cases they're the most informed and can bring the most information to bear uh, and and can highlight these risks. Uh, so the the uh, the responsibility is uh, and and the burdens are are increasing on once again that finite resource really exponentially. Indeed, I mean some research again we did uh, quite recently about the responsibilities of security managers, and this was across all size of firms. But it's been quite plain for the past five years, every year they have more to do. Every year, everything takes, you know, takes another step. They get more and more responsibilities, disaster recovery, business continuity, fraud, physical security, all being pushed on a security manager. So they're having to do more, and it's the more with less concept again. Yeah. The budgets have been flat for three years. They haven't seen anything. In fact, they've probably seen cuts you know, in their staff and their resources. So it's a tough world out there for security people. And because of the increasing amounts of pressure on performance of the company, uh, the bottom line, being more efficient, uh, driving out sort of as much as they can out of their operations, I do think that um, I, the IT department in the old days, not so long ago, were basically the guys who could say no and would be listened to and respected when it came to the board meeting. But now the pressure is almost flipped the other way and pressure is to say yes to most things um, and make it so. Well, I think... I think 
the sort of geography of work has changed apart from anything. Mm. So maybe 10 years ago, I, I don't want to overstate this, but, but you know, it's, it's a bit of a, a stereotype, but broadly speaking, 10 years ago, people were becoming to a workplace and doing work within an environment which, at least to some degree or another, these guys could exercise some control over. The fact of the matter is that now I can be productive for my business at the airport, at a hotel, at home, and not just in many locations, but also on many devices. And that really means that we, we have a sort of roaming workforce. Mm. And if security is going to be appropriate, it has to follow those individual members of staff where they go and whatever way they're handling the data these days. I guess this kind of neatly brings us around to some of the other technologies that are now being considered and used, and that is things like the cloud that we've all heard about, but virtualization as well in order to drive some of that flexibility. What kind of impact does that have on an SMB? Well, I think that, you know, number one, <clears throat> there's a tremendous cost savings opportunity associated with virtualization, both, you know, I think is mostly found in the, the server room and the server farm, either uh, on location or up in the cloud. Extraordinary cost savings there, as well as the environmental benefits that come along with it. Um, and, and also the, the desktops, uh, quite frankly, because you know, one of the potential ways of, of, of adding a, a, a bit of security to that story is you can, you can kind of bring yourself away from looking at the device and think in terms of delivering a service to a user regardless of what device that, that user is, is using. So there are some extraordinary benefits that, that potentially come along with. Unfortunately, there are additional things that you need to consider when you're, when you're uh, doing the virtualization thing. And, and the challenge for a lot of businesses is, is that nobody's 100% virtualized anymore. And of those that are in the virtualization game, probably 80 plus percent of all businesses now, um, you know, they still have a, a lot of you know, traditional, uh, uh, traditional endpoints out there. So now they have the additional responsibility of securing both, uh, uh, both uh, environments. And the way you do it, it is a little bit different. I mean, you can still secure a, a virtual machine using the traditional software that you would use to secure a, an endpoint, um, but there are some, uh, uh, some additional considerations that, that ought to be brought to bear there, um, both in terms of the efficiency that that security may or may not bring, uh, as well as uh, uh, just the ability to make sure that you are securing all of the new machines that are coming into your virtual domain. Uh, and, and adding that level of visibility and management to that virtual environment uh, is, a, is a potential challenge for the, for the security manager. I certainly think when talking to customers, I find that um, their, their level of awareness, particularly with some of that boundary shift, hasn't necessarily fully hasn't filtered developed. down. No, in fact, exactly. we've got our own research that suggests that that's exactly the case, where you know, the, the benefits are clear, um, and and there, are, there is a vague idea that there are some additional considerations that probably ought to be b brought to bear, uh, but even the, the level of comfort with the technology that's being deployed, let alone how you secure it, uh, is, is still evolving right now. And, uh, and it's incumbent upon you know, folks like ourselves and the, and the uh, vendor and analysts and, and education community to make sure that people are uh, aware of these, uh, these new fantastic technologies that uh, you know, need some additional consideration. I mean, just, just one of the things with the virtualization aspect is that because it's not a physical device being set up, there is that ease of doing it and the speed with which it can be done. And so there is a potential temptation for security not to be treated as rigorously as it would be if you were setting up a new physical box or even to be overlooked in that context I think you're getting at. And it may actually be a resource which is there one day and mm. not there another because it's so easy to bring it up and yeah. take it down again. I mean, one of the things about that from a very plain point of view is the licensing. All of a sudden, you're going to end up with loads more servers because it's so easy to create them. So you're going to get this sprawl of, of servers all doing small particular tasks. You've got to control them. You've got to have the licensing in, in place. It's, it's a tough world. And the management of all of this aspect, of course, is an additional overlay at the moment to an already stretched resource. Mm. Yeah. Um, do we feel that virtualization is actually increasing the threats or is it actually providing a blocker to preventing some of these new threats? I think that depends on what threats you're looking at. If you're talking about high availability, disaster recovery, flexibility, it's addressing those threats, fine. If you're talking about control and the, the pieces we mentioned earlier, then perhaps not addressing those so much. So it, you know, it comes with uh, benefits and drawbacks, really. I think the key is to realize, well, uh, uh, at the same time, seeing what great benefits it can give you, both from, from everything you've just said, Andrew, but also from the point of view of, of cost and so on at the same time realizing that security doesn't go away 
And if it's a physical server or a virtual one, the, the need is to protect the data that's on there and make sure that somebody can't undermine your business, basically. Yeah, which I think brings us around to a really key point. It's all about the data, really. We mentioned about the devices before, and you were talking about uh, protecting the users on different devices. But really, I think businesses need to focus in on the data and absolutely understand what data is really important to them. Because when you actually sort of start to dig through all the data you have, and you know, big data is a, is a common term these days, and what that really means is just we keep everything forever, and then we try and make some value out of it. But if you look down at your data and see what's really valuable, you'd be very surprised at how little is really core. I did this at one organisation I was working at a few years ago, and it was around 1% of the data we had, which was really important to us. And then there was you know, a, a larger piece, which was quite important, and then a lot of it was, wasn't terribly important in the, in the risk perspective. And that really empowers you. Because then you can start to focus your resource and just really focus your control and your monitoring on that really important piece of data. And so I think that's a worthwhile aspect for anybody. And that helps when you're talking about device control because you know what you need to protect and what can't go onto a, you know, perhaps an insecure device. And if we were to look at those insecure devices and, and hypothetically just say it, it is a subject of a bring your own device scenario that's happened, um, there has to be, a, I guess, a consideration to look at the benefit that you're going to achieve by rolling out something like BYOD in your business versus, of course, the costs of, of actually securing and managing that in the meantime. I mean, are there any kind of stats or information or surveys that have been done around how we feel that could be done? Is there a general feeling in the market from the experts at the moment? I, I think balancing the two, I'm, I'm not sure if there's been a really comprehensive study that really looks at both sides of the coin. There's clearly statistics that, that show that business managers absolutely see the cost savings associated with BYOD. It's very obvious, right? Um, and there are clearly businesses that see the, the pitfalls and the, the security problems. And you know, some of those businesses have gone out and they've, they've banned the devices and prohibited from doing this, that, and the other thing. I personally consider that to be, in some cases, the introduction of yet a new risk, uh, because you know any uh, enterprising employee who really wants to overcome it probably can, uh, given the given the right motivation. Um, but uh, y you know my my view on this is that uh, I view BYOD as an inevitability, and 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 whether or not you view it as a cost savings mechanism is is in my view sort of irrelevant. People, the devices are cheap. You know, they're, they're relatively inexpensive, and to most people, it's a matter of convenience for them, right? Um, they, they create, I, I heard one analyst say recently, uh, I wish I could cite it exactly, but I can't recall exactly who it was, that said, you know, you create on your PC, uh, you know, you consume on your tablet, and you snack on your, on, your, uh, on your mobile device, on your phone, you know, in terms of sort of the kitchen analogy. Uh, and that's true. It's a matter of convenience. And t to me, it's a matter of connectivity, right? I might access Facebook on three different devices over the course of a day. And to me, it's just a matter of convenience of whatever's closest to me and easiest to use given that set of circumstances. And that really, in my opinion, is what's driving BYOD. The burden is, okay, how do I deal with that knowing that my corporate data and my employees and, and partners and contractors, personal stuff is now intertwined. Uh, and, and you know, that, that's something that's just inevitable. You gotta deal with it. You gotta, you gotta manage it, you gotta see it. I think one of the interesting things there also is that while the employees are aware that they can access all the different things from the devices, what they're not so much used to is dealing with security in those contexts. So there's numerous surveys out there that show they're not proficient in setting up the device in a secure sense. They don't use, for example, pins or passwords to protect the mobile devices in many cases. In a great deal of cases, they're not used to the concept of malware affecting the mobile device. And there's evidence out there to show there's a significant increase in the level of threat that devices are facing there. But you talk to the users, and they've not seen it before in that context. They're used to it on the desktop. They're familiar with it there. And they don't recognize it in its potential new home. Which and so means, that's a real problem. Which means you know, creation and enforcement of new policy mm. and absolutely education, yeah. which, you know, a few years ago we were educating our employees about the need to, you know, make sure that you weren't leaving your laptop in your car at night and, and perhaps using, you know, some password discipline and that sort of thing. Mm. Now it's all kinds of additional things that you, that you, need, to, you need to consider. I think it also highlights the other thing about there's data and there's data. There's data, obviously, critical information, intellectual property and so on which belongs to the company. But there's data of another kind which cyber criminals are interested in, and that is um, 
information that I am in some way or another processing online, and I'm thinking here, just to give a concrete example, um, you know, if I have a Twitter account and I happen to tweet a complaint, a moan, a whinge about the fact that my company just moved to the latest version of application X and I hate it because I can't find anything. That sounds pretty innocent, but without realizing it, I have just told a would-be attacker that we standardize on that app. And if they can buy out there on the dark market an exploit which exposes or uses a vulnerability in that app, they're in. Or maybe I let slip which antivirus we use. In which case, again, I've just told them that when they're developing their code, they know exactly which antivirus to escape or mm. evade, and they don't have to worry about the rest of the marketplace. So even snippets of sort of personal slash corporate tidbits of information, which I wouldn't think are valuable, are actually getting stitched together, aggregated by cyber criminals. And however sophisticated some of these targeted attacks are, on big, big companies or small ones, often they start with an individual by exploiting an individual vulnerability. How should an SMB view its approach then to, to kind of securing these uh, or looking to adopt these new technologies? What would be the, what would be the starting point for? Well, it, I guess it depends on which technology we're talking about. One thing we haven't really touched upon, but we probably should, is cloud. Mm. And I think cloud's of great interest to every size of organization. Everybody wants to see that cost saving. Absolutely, every CIO is, can't wait to get their hands on it. And large organizations are a bit more fearful of the, of the risks that may be there. But smaller organizations are in a great situation. They, we recognize they're struggling with security. They may have their servers just in a cupboard, just you know, in the basement of, the, of wherever it happens to be their offices. So by actually moving to the cloud, they're going to get a real upscale, a real step up in security. You know, you're going to get resilience, you're going to get great power, you're going to get great bandwidth, you're going to get professionals looking after the hardware. So actually a cloud for a small company could be a real, a real benefit, a real step up in security for them. Yes, it's interesting to see uh, kind of what are the elements that people would entertain putting into the cloud. And I think the SMBs have certain day-to-day -day things that they obviously want to outsource the management of themselves. And that could be something as, as simple as an email system, for example, mm -hmm. which does free up a lot more of their time. But of course, with the expansion of the amount of endpoints now that they possibly have to manage, the cloud is accessed through the endpoint. So the endpoint rises back up to the top of, a, of, of the agenda again when it comes to management. Would you say that's the case? Absolutely elevates the importance of the endpoint, no, no doubt. Um, and you know, to your point earlier, the delivery of those applications and the, the need for training and expertise and redundancy and all those things, you know, you're going to get all those benefits from the cloud, absolutely. Uh, but then you know, the endpoint is, is the keys to get to that cloud. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, once again, elevates the, the attractiveness of, of that potential target. And in terms of how, you're, you're, to directly address your question, in terms of how you know, uh, SMBs could potentially look at that, is you know it's not only the acquisition of the technology needed to uh, to be able to see and control and secure the endpoints and the other technologies that we're talking about, but it's also the burden of you know learning it, deploying it, managing it over time. Particularly if these technologies are siloed, which means that every activity now becomes an additional activity in your day uh, that you need to think about from a from a management reporting perspective. Uh, so you know, I when I have the opportunity to speak with SMBs, I often you know really encourage them to think it through from beginning to end. It's not just the acquisition of the technology that they're looking at uh, to be to begin to address these needs, uh, but also the the long term impact on their business and, and the total cost of ownership. And then going back to the to that sort of point, it's the perception they've got of what they're going to get from particular technology. I mean, going briefly back to virtualization, if we could, I remember reading a survey, I can't remember exactly which one, but it had percentages talking to about 7,000 CEOs, CISOs, et cetera, around what they thought virtualization was doing to their security stance. Was it improving it? No change. And, or increasing the threat, and only 10% thought it was increasing the threats that they faced. About 40 odd percent, almost half actually, thought it was improving their security stance. So if that's the perception of them going into it, and you can say that for the various other technologies as well, their perception needs to match the reality of what they're then going to face when they use it. So it, it is at the, if you like, the IT manager level, making sure they've got a proper awareness of what they're getting themselves into. It can often be where you're focusing as well. If we were to take virtualization again as an example, uh, I hear a lot of discussion talking about the performance 
uh, the density and the performance of that particular solution um, from a technical standpoint. But security is not necessarily part of that conversation at that point, and yet adoption can occur mm. because of the cost savings. So as an afterthought, security can come in quite, quite far down the uh, pecking order sometimes. And as you well know, Andrew, being a Kaspersky guy, there are things that you can do from a security standpoint to absolutely pre preserve those, those benefits that you expected from your virtualization or your cloud investment. Um, in some cases, they require a little bit different approach. Uh, different technology uh, in, uh, in, in addressing the security, but, but there are absolutely some very innovative things that have happened over the last several years uh, that allow you to get both the security as well as the, uh, uh, the, perf the performance and cost savings and density benefits that you're looking for. Or, or indeed enhance them. I mean, in absolutely. terms of visibility, right. for right. example, yep. and seeing machines come up or go down and knowing they're protected, um, you know, you get a, an actual, an increase um, rather than even just maintaining it. So. But yet again, we're talking about a technology that sort of got ahead of security. Mm -hmm. Something that's been deployed before security got there and, and said, okay, well, I understand this. And it's this actually is, sold on security. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, happen, it happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. Technology just takes a leap ahead and security managers sat there not realizing the threat until it's too late, until it's already halfway deployed. So, I mean, perhaps I could uh, put a question out to you guys. Do you think that small businesses should consider managed service providers? Should they be looking for security as a service to be provided to them? So actually you've got specialist providers doing your firewall admin, looking after your, your, um, your security intelligence and whatever else. Is that a way forward for small businesses? I think it is in many cases. I mean, I think, you know, we, we talked already about all the constraints on small businesses and, and sort of too many jobs chasing too few resources, that can certainly help there because, you know, you, you can, if you're outsourcing it to somebody who knows what they're doing and is aware of the security aspects of that, then certainly there can be a huge benefit. There's no question of that, I think. Um, the question is always, and it's not just a sort of legislative compliance point of view, the question is always, it's still your data, mm -hmm. there's still your systems. So as long as you go into it knowingly, mm -hmm. that's the key, going into it knowing what you're going to get back and what the potential downfall may be. I think it's certainly part of a solution, but again, it, it is knowing the boundary of it because it's not going to change the requirement in the sense of responsibility to have awareness amongst the user community because they're still going to be a, a significant vulnerability within that context if they're still doing things that, that create exposures, even though certain parts of the solution, the technology aspects are better managed centrally in that sense, you've still got those endpoints that are going to be involved and the people using them and your data escaping in various directions if not done properly. So with the, with the SMB IT department having to become everything to everybody, um, being an expert in new technologies isn't necessarily going to be at the top of the, the list of their boss. How does a, where, where does an SMB go to, to, to try and find out more about the, the risks associated with some of these things? Great question. Well, I mean, there's guys like David. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, through the vendor community and through the analyst community, I mean, we, there's lots of expertise out here that's ready, willing, and able to share expertise. And, uh, and you know, I would strongly encourage people to go to places like, you know, places like Forrester, places like ThreatPost, you know, that, uh, that bring an extraordinary amount of, of knowledge and expertise to bear uh, and are, are really seeking to educate uh, the, uh, the business community and the technical community about the risks and potential solutions that, that can be brought to bear there. Um, you know, to your point earlier about, about managed services, I think that, uh, you know, there are fantastic opportunities that managed services bring to begin to outsource some of those, some of those extraordinary levels of expertise that are required in a lot of these technology areas but you know to your point as well it's still your data you're still responsible for it you better better make darn sure that whoever you're outsourcing this stuff to really knows what they're doing and where there is something that they can't deliver they can make sure that you're aware of it because I've yet to see the you know the managed service provider that does everything uh, which means that there still needs to be somebody back at the business who's responsible who understands what's going on and and can oversee a, a comprehensive uh, policy and, and, and program. Um, beyond that, you know, I would say that uh, um, most businesses really need to pay attention to what's going on, right? That, that you know, we're all going to do what we think are the, the basic blocking and tackling needed to protect our business. We're all going to put antivirus on our endpoints, right? Um, because we're, we're expected to. But there's a lot more to it. 
right? As the as the endpoints have expanded, so too have the 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 good housekeeping, the good hygiene techniques that are needed to protect those endpoints. Uh, and you need to know what they are, and you also need to know what the impact is going to be on you and your business as you begin to use these technologies. Uh, and and if you think it through, you can absolutely do it, but it does require some some foresight. On that last point, Peter, I think about looking at the risks to your business. I think that's critical. I mean, it, 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 all of us get exposed to uh, the headlines, um, and uh, they can be scary, um, but sometimes they can be a bit remote. And, and one of the dangers, I think, for a, for a business, especially small and medium-sized businesses, where they don't necessarily have the in-house resources, is that they look at numbers uh, as a way, perhaps, of, of trying to... Uh, give a reason for investment and I think it's the wrong way of looking at it. I think the, the risk assessment has to start with your business. What did we face in the last six months, the last quarter, the last year? What impact did it have? What impact could it have had had we not blocked it? And therefore are we doing the right things? And it's back to this, this, this kind of ongoing process, the housekeeping idea of security because it's only meaningful if it's tied down to your business's needs. So you can look at scary numbers about the costs of cybercrime or the cost of this attack, the average cost of an attack, and it's pretty meaningless. If you need to talk to your boss to say why we need this, that, or the other technology, it's best if it comes from, well, we need it because we had this incident. We need it because, actually, we blocked this incident last quarter, and in order to keep on blocking them, you need some further investment. So I think it's, it's got to start with a risk assessment for you. I agree that it needs to be a risk assessment for you, but I don't think it needs to just relate to internal problems that you've had. I think um, I've certainly used in my past uh, near misses from companies that are quite similar to me. That always makes you know, a really good a tale for the CEO. But they add spice to the story rather than they just do. being on their own. I but it's all about that focusing on the data. What's most important to you? Um, if this happens to our intellectual property, if this happens to our patents, if this happens to our designs, what's the impact to our organisation of this being compromised or being lost? Um, and that makes it very real and you really need to focus what we've been talking to CISOs for many years about is talking in business terms because it won't make that connection with the CEO unless you start to talk about it in those business terms. Talk about profit, talk about finance, talk about you know, um, whatever it happens to be that really works with that organisation because if you just come in and say we need a new firewall, it's just going to be, you know, no, go away, leave my room. So absolutely talk in business terms, make sure it correlates with what the organisation is focused on. And have you found that there is a slightly different kind of approach or attitude between a, an enterprise on one hand or an SMB on the other in terms of framing it in a business term? I think, I think there probably is because the larger, larger organisations have more time to consider this. Yeah. They have more ability to actually start to think about how all these processes fit together and the potential impact. In a small, medium business, the IT guys are running around trying to keep the lights on and then they have to do this in their spare time. But it's one of the key things that we see when you look at both large and small organizations One of the biggest problems that uh, security people have is priority changing. Mm -hmm. So you actually get someone to approve your new uh, piece of hardware or software or new whatever it happens to be. And then actually you get halfway through deploying it and the business goes, ah, stop, we need that money for something else. And that happens all the time. And the way to stop that happening is actually engage the business in the decision so they know why they made that investment and that decision in the first place. And then that problem just falls off the radar and when it comes down to we need some more money, the business don't look at the security aspect because they know, they know why they put it there. They know what it's addressing. It's not just another technology solution. It's actually adding business value. So that's a, a real key uh, recommendation for when you're talking, trying to get investment. I think it's probably worth adding that evidence-based messaging and the correct framing of it ought not just to apply to, to the discussions with the CEO. It also ought to be when you're then trying to engender the support and the cooperation of the user community. So actually showing that there is something within your organisation or in organisations similar to yours, that something does happen, can happen, could happen to them. So the more the messaging can be individualised, personalised to their environment, the more likelihood there is of them actually accepting that there is a case to answer in terms of doing what's being asked of them. And if there's a policy also, that could help. And of course you've always got the slight problem of the natural tendency to think, well, it couldn't possibly happen to me. Mm -hmm. I'm an SMB, <laughs> I'm not Barclays, for yes. example. So that so, evidence. Yeah would do it, potentially. Yeah, we're all, part of, we're all part of a greater economy. 
you know, and it's not just the effect on my business that I need to be concerned about, but it's also the effect on my customers and on my partners. You know, we've seen a lot of examples in the recent past where the initial entry point is not even the target company, but it's a partner of that company, and it comes through somebody as, you know, as an HR uh, administrator who opens an email, they gain access to that partner, get some intellectual property there, and find their way into a, another partner. And next thing you know, they're they're getting their hands on some pretty valuable data upstream from a, even a small business to a very large organization. Uh, and so, you know, once again, it's that is a circumstance where you really, you know, obviously it's not just good endpoint hygiene, but it's also uh, educating your your end user community. Uh, and and we need to be increasingly aware of that. Absolutely, and I, I, I would sort of look at the sense of, in a tough market, um, it's harder to differentiate yourself. Things are very noisy, they're very hard to, to put your company forward in order to win that bit of business. Security, and this is really where can reputation like can come in. Right. Absolutely, I mean, I was okay. in one organization and we decided to do that exact thing, that we decided to try and get ISO 27000 to differentiate our organization to win new business. Mm -hmm. And that was the sole reason they went for security. So when they were at a beauty parade to which firm should we choose, they could stand up and say, we're the only one who's secure out of this selection. Why would you choose anybody else? You know, that's so security can be a differentiator. And talking about the extended enterprise, the fact that everything's being fragmented, I'm sure a lot of smaller organizations are experiencing this now, experiencing the pressure from the larger corporates that they perhaps support and supply, that they're pushing um, questionnaires down and asking them, why are you secure? What do you do? What's your disaster recovery like? And that is a good way, again, to provide an impetus and momentum for security in the organization because all of a sudden your key customers are demanding some sort of security. Mm -hmm. And it, that's, that's a good way to get attention at the board level. I think things like the Information Security Breaches Survey support that view, so increasingly saying that people are looking for security in other people as, as a basis for doing business. doesn't necessarily mean they've got it in place themselves, but it is one of the, the selection criteria. So, yeah. I think it works the other way too, actually, Steve. So if you're a small business maybe looking to put stuff up in the cloud, you should be doing the same thing with those guys and saying, well, how can you reassure me that my data will be secure? Mm -hmm. How can you reassure me that you're not going to be the next LinkedIn, Last.fm, HB Gary, whoever it is? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it, 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 there's a danger of looking at it and saying, well, actually, that's those guys, not us. But this is your data, <laughs> and if you're going to entrust somebody with it, you need to know that it's going to be secure. Well, gentlemen, I think uh, we're coming to the end of our session now, so I'd like to thank everyone's involvement, and I'd certainly like to thank the audience for, for tuning in and uh, listening to what hopefully has been a, a valuable session for you. And uh, many thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.